we're going to talk about coccidia in shelters and using um, panazaril in our protocols. So just as a review of coccidia, these are intracellular protozoan parasites that are commonly found in the gastrointestinal tract of dogs and cats. They are species specific, so dogs have their own and cats have their own. And we commonly see them infecting juvenile animals, especially under six months of age. To see um, these parasites in adult animals is pretty rare. Usually they have to be immunosuppressed for us to find those um, on our fecal samples. And when you look at the literature, the prevalence rates of coccidia vary somewhere between 3% to more than 30% in dogs and cats. If we are seeing clinical signs from these infections, it's typically going to be gastrointestinal in nature, so diarrhea, vomiting, certainly abdominal pain or inappetence and lethargy are going to be the most common signs that we see. And if those symptoms are left untreated um, or if the animals are especially young or uh, weakened by other um, malnutrition, then they can develop more serious signs such as dehydration or even we may see hemorrhagic diarrhea and, and blood loss and anemia due to those um, complications. Uh, because puppies and kittens are more likely to show symptoms from these infections, they can also be reactivated in times of stress, certainly which would include being weaned from their mothers or entering a shelter environment. And once the oocysts are shed into the environment and the housing area, then they can remain infective for up to a year um, unless they're exposed to very high temperatures or freezing, for example. Complete removal is not as easy as with Giardia um, when we're talking about coccidia. So um, contaminated surfaces that have coccidia cysts have to be treated with 10% ammonia for 10 minutes or steam cleaned. So it's much more difficult to get rid of these cysts once they get into the environment. Clinical signs can resolve without therapy and certainly that's why we don't necessarily recognize these um, infections in adult immunocompetent animals. Um, but you know, we're veterinarians, we like to treat animals. Treatment certainly speeds resolution and it can decrease the environmental contamination that we're worried about um, with contaminating the environment with the oocysts and causing um, risks of reinfecting that animal or infecting other animals later on. So the two drugs I've got up here on the screen, I'm just going to briefly talk about. Um, sulfadimethoxine or Albon is the only drug that has been approved for the treatment of coccidiosis in dogs and cats. This is something that's been around for a long time, certainly something that many of our colleagues in private practice use. Um, many, you know, pet owners and foster parents may be familiar with Albon. And this is just, it's a sulfa antibiotic. Um, and a typical course is going to be administered once daily for somewhere between 10 and 14 days. Um, and that drug, it's important to realize, is coccidiostatic. So it's, it's helping to suppress the organism um, for the animal's immune system to take over. And then more recently, we've started reaching for this other drug there on the screen, which many of you are familiar with, is uh, Panazaril. And the trade name of that drug is marketed by Bayer, and it's actually an equine product. So the trade name is Marquee, and it comes as a paste. Um, you'll see on the screen there, there's a horse on the box. Um, comes in a very large tube because it's administered to horses. And it's actually, it's a treatment for a protozoal parasite of horses. Um, it causes um, equine protozoal myeloencephalitis. So what we've realized is that this um, drug is coccidiocidal. So just the same way it treats the um, protozoal parasite of horses, it can treat coccidia in our dogs and cats. So we don't actually know the specific mechanism of action of panazaril against coccidia, um, but we do know that it interferes with the, the parasite's ability to divide and, and replicate, and it seems to be very well tolerated in dogs and cats, even very young animals. So the way we see this used in shelters and rescue groups is that you would buy an entire tube of the paste, and then you can dilute it down to be able to administer it to smaller animals. You can also purchase panazaril from compounding pharmacies as well, and you'll see it in different um, concentrations and formulations and different flavorings. So the paper that I want to briefly review for you guys um, is brand new and um, it's pretty exciting. It's a short communication paper. Um, it's currently in press in the Veterinary Parasitology Journal and it comes to us from Dr. Litster. Um, but the purpose of this study was to determine the efficacy of treatment with panazaril paste at three different dose regimens um, in shelter housed dogs and cats who had confirmed coccidiosis. And this is a really important determination for shelters to make. It's an important research project because we want to be able to balance both the cost of treatment as well as the length of time that we're treating these, um, these patients with the efficacy of the protocols so that we're minimizing the length of stay in the shelter and we're optimizing the resources that we have available um, to treat these animals. So these are their methods.
Um, they had dogs and cats that were admitted to the Paws Chicago shelter, um, were screened at intake for the presence of coccidia by a zinc sulfate centrifugal fecal flotation. And they also scored the feces um, based on their appearance for their consistency. And that's using the Purina fecal scoring system. And it's a scoring system that you may have seen, Purina markets the charts, um, where one denotes really uh, dry, firm feces, and seven is the other end of the scale denoting very watery feces. The animals also received regular intake processing, which includes vaccination, physical exam. They were dewormed with pyrantal, uh, praziquantel, and received revolution at intake. And then also, uh, very importantly, infected animals were bathed on day one um, of intake to the shelter with just shampoo and water, and that's to help reduce the risk of reinfection. So just like with Giardia and um, environmental contamination, we worry a lot about um, coccidia shedding and the oocyst getting stuck in the fur, and then that animal getting reinfected when it's grooming itself. Then animals were allocated to one of the three treatment groups um, that I'm going to describe. And the researchers were particularly um, interested in the efficacy of the second and third um, dose regimen. So more cats were allocated to those two groups. So the three dosing um, regimens that they were interested in studying um, are the 50 mg per kg every 24 hours for three consecutive days, and then 50 mg per kg as a single dose on day one, and then also 20 mg per kg as a single dose on day one. And then once they were in the shelter and they had been um, allocated to those treatment groups, they were um, housed either individually, they may have been co-housed with their litter mates, or a few animals were sent to foster homes. And then fecal samples were rechecked again at day three or four, and also day eight. And the reason that those times were chosen is very specific times, obviously. And that was, um, it was very specific because the, we needed to know whether um, those animals were positive at that time frame because it could indicate either treatment failure or reinfection. So when looking at the time frame, the minimum prepatent period for canine coccidia is six days and for feline coccidia species is four days. So if an animal came in and was positive on day one and was treated and was still positive at day three or four, that is earlier than the prepatent period, so we know that that represents a treatment failure and not a reinfection uh, from the environment. And then animals that still had oocysts at day three to four, where they hadn't cleared their infection, those animals were then divided into two groups. And some of them received dosage one to see if they would then clear their infection. Other animals received no treatment and just were housed in the shelter to see if they would clear it on their own um, over the next few days. And that just depended on the housing availability at the time. So these are the results. In the first group, the dosage one, which was 50 mg per kg daily for three consecutive days, 93% uh, of the dogs were negative on both the fecal analysis that was done at day three and four and day eight. And then for cats in that group, 87.5% of the cats were negative. For dosage two, which was the 50 mg per kg dose once on day one at intake, 77% of the dogs and 80% of the cats were negative at both day three to four and day eight. There were also two cats and two dogs in that group that were negative at day three to four, but then were positive at day eight. And then finally, in the third dosage group, which is the lowest dose, the 20 mg per kg once on day one, 69% of the dogs were negative on day three to four and day eight, and 48% of the cats were um, negative for oocyst on both of the recheck fecals. So you can see sort of a declining efficacy um, as you go through the treatment groups. Also, they commented on a few other specific results that were um, of notable. So six animals had different coccidia species that were identified at day one versus day three to four, which could indicate newly acquired um, infections from environmental contamination or potentially that the animals were infected with both, but on that first day one fecal, there just wasn't enough to detect them. The oocyst excretion was below the detection limit. And then also, treatment efficacy was related to the fecal oocyst count at day one. So animals that had a high initial oocyst count, so they had more of the coccidia in their fecal sample, they were statistically more likely to remain infected on day three to four. So it was harder for them to clear. And they, they had that information because um, the fecal samples were also sent to the university lab for um, quantification of the oocyst count. And then also, 
fecal consistency score and infection status were unrelated. So when I talked about that, using that Purina fecal score of looking at the feces and, and scoring them based on whether or not they were normal or had diarrhea appearance, um, cats that were still infected at day three to four had statistically lower fecal consistency scores at day one. So that means they were still infected, they failed the treatment, but they had normal, dry, firm stool um, on presentation. So this has been repeated in other studies as well that have been published, um, and you can find in the literature that fecal consistency score, especially in cats, and infection status are unrelated. Um, so that means sometimes you can't tell just by looking at an animal whether or not it's infected with coccidia and whether or not it's shedding oasis into the environment. So the conclusions of the paper state that the results support the use of oral panazaril at 50 mg per kg every 24 hours for three consecutive days for treatment of coccidiosis in dogs and cats with a follow-up fecal flotation performed immediately after treatment. And then if the animal's still infected, then we would retreat and follow up with another fecal examination. Single doses of less than 50 mg per kg do not appear to be efficacious. But we do still need additional research to investigate using panazaril at higher doses, even than 50 mg per kg, um, to determine if there is a protocol that will reliably clear the infection. Um, there are concerns of neurotoxicity at higher doses, so the ideal dose and the length of time that we would dose the animals is still not completely known. And again, this is sort of a balancing act because we want to be able to move these animals through the shelter system in an efficient and timely manner and not hold on to them just to treat them with repeated doses if we can find the right dosing regimen. What might this mean for you? Um, certainly, based on this study, whenever you get back to the shelter or to your clinic, maybe just reevaluate your um, coccidia protocols, your um, prevention and treatment protocols, especially because of the time of year that we're in. Kitten season is certainly in full swing in most of our facilities, and so this may be on at the forefront of everyone's mind. And maybe you made your dosing chart a few years ago, and, and it's time to just reevaluate. I do just want to point out, um, be sure that you realize that uh, this dose, um, the 50 mg per kg dose, is higher than the dose that is discussed in plums. So certainly you just want to check that. Um, and see if you want to change the frequency of the dose that you're using as well as the actual dose. And then really important to keep in mind this, um, the risk of environmental contamination and reinfection from the environment. So if you are having trouble with coccidia in the shelter, especially with kittens um, or diarrhea that's persisting with these kittens, if they're in foster care or if they're in the shelter, really kind of taking a look at the husbandry, um, thinking about the litter box and um, disposable litter boxes, tossing them out at the end of every day can really help to sort of break that cycle and, and working with foster parents to make sure that they understand how important um, good hygiene is, keeping those kittens clean, um, bathing them if, they're, if that's necessary because as they are grooming themselves and playing in the litter box and doing all the things that kittens do, they can certainly be reinfecting themselves and causing us headaches. So um, it's a balancing act certainly between the medications that we can use to treat but also all the adjunct therapy, the husbandry protocols that we can use um, just to make this a manageable situation. All right, and that's my email address. Certainly, please let us know how this is working for you. Thanks.